So I'll just start dive right into questions. And the first one is at the 1994 uh, Forest Conference in New Orleans, you gave a talk called Never Modern, um, Never Been, Never Ever, Some Thoughts About Never Never Land in Science Studies, which is a fabulous title. Um, and some of that has been lost to history, but can you tell us a little bit about the paper? Well, I tried to reconstruct the paper. I actually wrote that one, which is unusual for me. But I think that the you know there were some demons of revenge because it's disappeared from all of my files. But I, I do remember that it was a kind of engaged friendship with Bruno Latour in particular, and his a very generative little book, We Have Never Been Modern, which I, as well as many other people, learned a great deal from. And Bruno had become both a friend and a colleague and a kind of a, not a frenemy exactly, but a, a person to tussle with. <laughs> uh, a person I love dearly and I think, uh, you know, we both uh, really, really value, I know, we both really treasured each other's friendship and it was very warm and very affectionate. And also intellectually a kind of um, uh, some very interesting frictions between us. And that this paper, was my, you know, never, uh, thoughts about Never Never Land in Science Studies. said, yes, um, that this is, uh, for a long time now, you have been completely thrown back to intersectional feminist theory, to feminist science studies, to non-West thinking in spite of an occasional example in your in the writing. You continue to draw on on um, uh, particular kinds of European scholarly sources that emphasize a masculine individualist a war as the fundamental scope, and you can't do you're setting out to do. You can't do the kind of modernity and the, the modern and propose what he now calls land on earth love, a kind of love of the earth, which I think Bruno was working toward very much in 1994. Um, achieve your practices and network-based thinking about knowledge making, including the sciences, unless you engage um, with the other social movements that are at the root of science, most certainly including intersectional feminist science studies, um, the kind that I think Tricia Hill Collins and my myself and Sandra Harding and Evelyn Hammonds and Lee Starr and, and, and. You know. <laughs> I think that um, at that time in Bruno's work, not true now, there's really big changes. At that time in Bruno's work, he systematically did not cite any of us. Mm -hmm. And people like Lee Starr and I and others were uh, quite angry about the masculinism of it all. And um, I'm and that paper was, I, I tend to work with laughter as my fundamental method, uh, and it's a genuine laughter at the absolute absurdity of all of us making these claims that sound like we actually know something. <laughs> you know? Um, uh, and, it, and the laughter is also a very serious method that tries without um, thinking that I myself or any of us are innocent of the very things we're criticizing. Um, a kind of an invitation to somehow um, join with each other in something better than what we've already done. And I think that the exploration of the, uh, the vice grip of the fantasy of um, um, being modern, uh, which, which Bruno was an early, I think this is not turning in, into an English sentence. Bruno thought early and deep about that. But I really felt that his citation that was has um, indicated a kind of brain damage. <laughs> if that makes any sense. <laughs> so, you know, it, you know, I think Bruno took it in that kind of angry, friendly vein. Which, uh, and we have remained very, if anything, ever deepening friends. Mm -hmm. But this has been a, a, a tussle for decades, this particular issue. Okay. Um, basically, uh, I wanted to ask you um, about your talk from that year, which was described as a star performance. Um, and when you really, you know, you took the SDAS world by storm. And did you think at the time that you were making a serious field disrupting intervention? Well, of course not. 
Uh, and I still find it um, hard to get my mind wrapped around uh, that. Although I, I do know now, and, and I knew a little bit then, that when I speak in public performance, there's a kind of charismatic um, performance that goes on that um, sweeps people into some kind of shared emotional and intellectual experience. Um, and I don't know exactly how it happens, but I think as we get older, we each kind of learn what our gifts and weaknesses are. And I, I knew that that, um, I knew that that was how I worked even then. And um, I was happy to use it as I could. And uh, I thought and still think that um, particular in that period, Adele Clark and Lee Starr um, and Evelyn Hammonds and me and Sandra Harding, I particularly in that period, and Lucy Suchman, my God, uh, that we were a we in some profound sense. We were coming into a, a power that we had created for each other uh, and sustained for each other. And it's not that in some way we were in profound opposition to the men in our field. We weren't. Um, but that there was a kind of um, uh, intersectional feminist power going on that uh, I felt like several of us were performing by the mid-90s and bringing people with us. And so one of the few terms that I will steal from the uh, software industry is disruption. Um, and part of what made that moment so um, important and so powerful and memorable is that it was a moment of disruption um, where you were able to challenge big ideas and um, that were widely accepted at the time um, and widely kind of championed and not questioned. Um, and so what current mainstream or mainstream STS ideas should we be challenging right now? Well, I know. Uh, you know. I mean, that's a that's kind of answer. And it's saying as my close friend, anthropologist, uh, uh, mushroom, the end of, mushrooms at the end of the world, a title to die for. Anyway, Anna and I were doing a joint gig recently, and we joked with you. You know a certain, you know something about something, and you put it out there for a public, and then you get about other things nothing whatsoever about, and you have to pretend like you do. Uh, so I feel a little bit like <laughs> a little bit like that. That said, and I have, I have lots of opinions on this question. Um, and um, I think that we live in very scary times, uh, profoundly scary times of a kind of resurgent, racist, misogynist, nationalist, murderous, um, world in which um, you know the forced migrations of so many human beings they're almost uncountable and the forced migrations of the more than human as well the forced homelessness the forced destruction of pathways and quarters and welcome the forced destruction of refuge um, and that the there's never been a time more for Seriously, oracle, different, trying to understand other, other times of forced migration and genocide and um, the role of the sciences in that, the ongoing role of the sciences in militarism, but I don't, that's my fundamental focus here. I think it's very important to try to understand what we've inherited, we meaning earthlings, <laughs> and it was uh, unprecedented. And that science studies, along with just about everybody else, I think every serious person, certainly every serious scholar, um, needs to be paying serious attention. Again, going back to Bruno, um, his landing on Earth, his, um, that most recent book of his, this most recent one I've read since we started my engagement with him, uh, is his um, ferocity and urgency around the dilemma of uh, massive formations of uh, people in, and powers and practices have uh, are an active denial of what it would take to actually share this earth in some way that is for flourishing and ongoingness. I'm avoiding the word sustainability because it's so contaminated, but it's not a bad word. Um, it's kind of, of ongoingness um, committed to uh, sharing uh, this earth. 
uh, there are astonishing forces arrayed in active denial. And we three all live in Trumplandia right now. Um, and so we wake up this morning to, you know, an offer to buy Greenland so as to exploit it for fossil fuels and uranium to a um, removal of the rule that limited the incarceration of migrant children to a uh, dismantling of yet one more endangered, you know, um, conservation measure, to, uh, on and on. We wake up on a daily basis, and I have deep friends, I mean, really, really close friends and former students in Brazil who, who write me about Bolsonaro, and we look at Turkey, Hungary, and, and for that matter, um, on and on we go. Um, you know, I just got back to Colombia, where my colleagues and friends are in still hope, but deeper and deeper worry that the hard won, flawed, but real peace agreement with the FARC that uh, muted the paramilitaries for a time is unraveling. It's heightened danger. And uh, I think science studies has a great deal to offer, in, um, including thinking hard about what constitutes what constitutes corridors for people and, and African people, both how to hold what we've got, but also design and build, think and develop practices with each other. And science studies scholars, as a group, are awfully good <laughs> at knowing to strive, theorize, work with, uh, offer uh, an understanding of practices, both old and new. Um, and uh, so I think we should just get on with it. <laughs> And I think this is a really great place to ask you the next question um, with like understanding that like science studies has a place, uh, an emergent place in the, in the global order of knowledge making and knowledge based practices. Um, in 2016, you published your two most recent books, uh, Manifestly Haraway and Staying with the Trouble. And in them, you refer to this moment that we're in as um, like part of various scenes, so the capital scene, the Cthulhu scene, uh, etc., where others have used the term Anthropocene. Uh, would you say that you're calling for a complete turn away from the Anthropocene discourse, or are you somebody who is adding to it or challenging well, it? I've thought a lot about that. Um, I wish the term had never been invented, but it was. <laughs> and it uh, has been adopted by many communities of practice. It does a huge amount of work. Um, there is, I think it would be foolish to pretend that one, that, that um, a person situated such as I am could operate without that term. Um, and I'm always a both and kind of girl. I want the litter to get bigger rather than produce a kind of prohibition against something and kick it out of the litter. Um, and I'm interested in putting my out other ways of thinking of the dense time space we're in would kind of um, a thick present, not an instantane, a present of indefinite boundaries. That kind of, clearly, if um, if I had to choose between Anthropocene and capitalism, I would choose capitalism because I think it makes very clear we're talking about a world system that was invented about 500 years ago it's a horrible cartoon version, but it's not all the time everywhere, and it's not all of the people swept into capital, capitalist practices and, and modes of value creation, value extraction. That a serious understanding of the capitalist scene and the way that Jason Moore does um, is absolutely necessary. Um, and then um, Anna and I and colleagues in Denmark thought we had invented the term plantation scene, but I know subsequently. And I know because feminist, African American feminists who pointed out ferociously that how dare we use that term without bringing Hortense Spillers and Sylvia Winter back into the conversation, that we alluded to slave, I anyway, um, I think I'm more guilty about this than Anna, alluded to slave gardens because I knew they were very important, but I didn't cite the named scholarship of the folks who had done the work. Uh, that the plantation of scene is truth somehow. That is, because of the word, but the conceptual understanding of the absolute 
fundamental earth-changing um, worlding of uh, particularly of the, Atlant of the Atlantic Bay slave trade and all that it brought with it. Uh, it can't be named list of forced labor and, and um, substitution of displaced plants and broken uh, ties of generations. See, I think what characterizes the plantation of scene is the breaking of the care of generations. That what both human beings and, and other than human beings are robbed of is the capacity to take care of their children. Uh, the breaking of generations so as to, to so as to force them into systems of reproduction rather than generativity and production are apparatuses for the uh, creation and extraction of value and the plantation of scene was a invention. so for example you you guys probably also read the amazing five-part series in the New York Times last week the last couple of weeks um, scene 19. Of hereditary forced African slavery into the English colonies. There was a piece of which was really, really important, and I wish it could be required reading for everybody. From a science studies perspective, what this piece was doing was uh, explicating, showing how many critical technologies the so called modernity were invented and practiced and consolidated and standardized in the period of Caribbean slavery, Brazilian, Caribbean, Florida, in the period of, of slavery in that, era, in that world. Double entry book, the uh, hierarchies, rewards, and punishment in labor, the particular kinds of relocation of labor so it's never home, but uh, escape and find family. The breaking of him. Anyway, uh, I think working with the plantation is really important. And there's a way in which the Anthropocene and the Capitalist scene, though they kind of acknowledge it, excuse me, run roughshod over it, and also don't emphasize the absolutely contemporary issues of plantations. Well, certainly, I mean, obviously, uh, the uh, oil kinds of deforestation and then supposed reforestation, even with carbon budget credits with plantations, the devastations of uh, human beings and living so I'm for anything that's what I call uh, So the Thulusi from Sonic, again, Greekish, <laughs> uh, not from Cthulhu of Lovecraft, but from uh, uh, an evocation of the Earth tentacular ones, the critters of the earth. The Thulu scene is not over and it's not, not safe, it's not innocent, but it's also not, uh, there's a way in which plantation of scene, capitalist scene are the time of, are the times of critique. And the Thulu scene is a time of uh, uh, embracing, being embraced by the ongoing generativity you know, of things. All of these words um, make a hash out of what I would call a, a serious ethnographic sensibility. I think we talked about this at the conference in Santa Cruz a little bit. For example, climate change as a concept, and certainly Anthropocene as a concept, is a southern importation, more or less hostile, certainly sus in the circumpolar north, uh, who have perfectly good idioms, languages, conceptual apparatuses, historical reflection for dealing changes in refractions you know, stars, changes in the sea ice, the changes in the weather, organized around the concept of scylla or breath. Translated that these, these translations don't quite work. What would it take for the, the southerners, Canadians, United Statesers, who and the northerners to form serious contact zones with their conceptual apparatuses? in a way that really led all this to um, and identify who is, who is in most trouble, human and non-human. So all of those words don't even begin to suggest indigenous and, and, uh, and more than indigenous. Indigenous. 
Okay. You guys have switched orientations. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you have to. But you didn't actually switch because you're in different places. Oh, well, never mind. So I will be presenting at 4S for the first time this year. And um, 4S is also creating better avenues for undergraduate participants to um, present their work. And so do you have any advice for us first -timer timers who may still be working out the kinks in our presentations? Oh, well, first of all, what are you presenting on? I was curious what your work is. Sure. Um, so um, I'm presenting on work that I did um, actually in my master's, which is a slightly different topic of what I'm working on now. Um, but the presentation is called um, Race, Modernity, and Hospitality, and it's a play on hospital and hospitality. And I studied um, international clinical volunteerism in Kansas. Um, oh, where? Sorry? Where? Um, International uh, volunteers. Oh, right? in, in Tanzania. In Tanzania. Mm -hmm. Okay, really interesting. And uh, Adita, are you presenting this time too? Uh, yeah, but this is uh, uh, my actually uh, an early uh, dissertation draft, uh, <laughs> early dissertation chapter draft, um, and it's going to be about modes of attention uh, and boundaries of ecosystems when it comes to wildfires. Uh, so, are you paying particular attention uh, to wildfires in like Alaska, California, Indonesia? Where are you? Where are you? Um, I'm currently based out of Toronto, but I did much of my field work in California, uh -huh. which is why I was in Santa Cruz. Um, did you do any field work last summer? Uh, not last summer. I actually did all of my field work this year. Uh -huh. um, and uh, yeah, so I, I've been thinking about fires. Um, both in ecosystems, but uh, outside of ecosystems, and the discrepancy of attention uh, and the modes of attention through which they are filtered and uh, brought forth into the public imagination. And that's one of the things that I'm looking about, uh, thinking about, but also uh, modes of attention that is entrained um, when it comes to fire ecologists um, when they pay attention to the earth and yeah. Yeah. sort of forensic ways that they record fires. Yeah. Well. I don't exactly have any advice. It's more like um, my own experience was when I just leapt into what I really cared about and just did it. Um, it worked because I made it a point. Um, well, and if I didn't care, life is too short. Uh, and if it's too short. Uh, that finding those points of, of uh, ongoing generativity with, for each other, and forgetting about saying whether it's part of a master's or a dissertation or a what you, who cares? <laughs> you know, rather, to leap right into the stuff, because that's what matters. Um, that uh, I'm really passionate about the, the, the questions around hospitality that affect international volunteers in health type situations, particularly in East Africa, or uh, wildfires that have been burning across so much of the world, most well, certainly practically all of North America. But road from California to um, uh, Yellowstone and then down to Zion, or uh, Zion, um, Grand Tetons. Uh, there wasn't a single And then remembering the history of firing this land this land that I'm on right this exact minute, when the uh, Amamudsen were, were doing controlled burns and the whole thing, uh, fire. Um, I think you've uh, Born in Flames too, that really film back from, um, my mind is blanking on the name of the filmmaker, but you could you probably could put it anyway. Born in Flames. So my only advice is for you and perhaps everybody else, is um, not to tell people where you are professionally, particularly unless they ask, or what this is part of or was part of, but the questions that interest me uh, in, this, in this situation are. And, go for it, go for it. and um, this also uh, goes back a little bit to the Thulucine question from before. Um, I, I, take, I continue to take seriously that little piece I wrote in both friendship and some friction with Sandra Park, that situating what we know so as to be accountable and responsible. And then another kind of little add-on is that actually the last book I wrote 
was the alliance with Adele Clark and Michelle Murphy and Kim Talbert and Ruha Benjamin and Chi Ling uh, Wu and Yuling Wang. And I had this awful feeling I'm leaving someone out called Making Kin Not Population, which grew out of a 4S presentation where collectively and from very, very different points of view and some real disagreement in our group, really important friction in our group, we felt that we just had to raise again outside, outside Malthusian parameters on um, the question of human numbers, distribution, unequal extractions, that we, just, that we had to learn to do it in an anti-racist, a non-misogynist, non-Malthusian way, because if not us, then who? So I feel that way about a lot of our work. If not us, then who? If you're not going to do it, who will? Yeah, um, I guess in this in this context, uh, and this touches on pretty much everything we've talked about so far. Um, what do you see as the future of STS, uh, specifically feminist STS? And do you see it as contained in the academic world or going beyond it? Uh, and and how does this 4S conference and how can 4S as a society in general shape this future? Well, it's never been contained by the academic world, but the academic world is a very important, um, I have never been one to diss scholarship and teaching and re you know, research and the space that uni universities make and the reclaiming of public universities and holding them to account, especially. Uh, private, so-called private ones too, but which also are sub heavily subsidized, but that's another set of issues. Um, I feel that um, university-based scholarship and teaching and mentorship and camaraderie remain really important. And um, interceptional feminist science studies has never been uh, restricted to that space. Quite the opposite, it's always been highly permeable. And many of us um, have felt that our, our largest job was to make available the resources of the university to groups with fewer resources. Uh, not all of us feel that way, nor do we have to, but to be in connection with the kinds of, of um, knowledge making and action in other communities of practice, be they policy or uh, water defenders or um, you know international volunteers or that being in, in having attachment site with other communities of practice really matters. And I think science studies as a whole has been pretty good at that. And I think feminist science in particular has been especially good at it. And, we'll and I have an origin story about science studies, not just feminist science studies. It's not the Edinburgh School and the whatever. It's in, it's in activities like science, it's an activity against chemical and biological warfare and the Boston Women's Health Collective. Those are my origins as a science scholar. And that way predated uh, the official, you know, the, the really important scholarly work, for example, by Steve Schaefer and, and other really, really wonderful men and scholars. Uh, it's not dissing it at all. I have a pretty strong sense about um, the uh, study also has in many. By the way, there's one other little piece of that. And that, that goes back to your question earlier about do I, as a 75-year-old lady, have any advice? <laughs> and that is, um, hold on to your peers, the writing groups, the, the ways you mentor each other. Uh, hold on to your, your cohort. Uh, and those colleagueships and friendships, even if they get really quite difficult, don't let them uh, dissolve into antagonisms or indifference. Those important kinds of um, sustenance in the next few years is going to come from your cohort. Your mentors are well and great, and if, if you're lucky, really good mentors, but the, the folks who really are going to matter the most are your, your cohort. That's a great place to hook up. <laughs> Um, thank you so much. This was um, a great conversation and I think is going to be very helpful for new um, and old foresters um, or returning foresters um, in the future and um, in light of this conference. And so thank you so great. much for sitting great. with us.
Um, and yeah. And while you're in New Orleans, be sure to say hello to Tanya Perez and Lucy Suchman for me and others too, but uh, I'm not going to get to be there and I'm missing all my friends. Oh, we're, we will miss you at the conference, but thank you for kind of phoning in for us. And thank you for the interview. Thank you for your time. Bye.